And uh, we have, I know on Wednesdays we have been going through the book of Galatians, and we will, of course, go back to that. Uh, but I want to uh, minister something that I, the Lord uh, directed me to, to minister on. We talked Sunday night on responding to receive. And uh, we want to continue along those lines tonight because of uh, the meetings that we have coming up. And uh, we'll be advertising this even more as we move along, but uh, it's never too early to prepare. On May 13th, which is a Wednesday, uh, we will have a, a lady with us by the name of Sandra uh, Borat. And she is an uh, Orthodox Jew. Uh, she actually lives in uh, Judea and uh, ministers for a, uh, a uh, Christian Jewish organization. And she'll be with us sharing uh, on the state of the Jews in Israel at this time and uh, uh, all that our nation's doing for Israel and the importance of what's going on. And so uh, you'll definitely want to be here and uh, bring somebody with you. Uh, but Matthew chapter 4, we want to continue with this responding to receive. And here's why. Not just the, the, the special meetings that we have coming up uh, with Brother Jerry, but just every service that I come to. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor and I'm a firm believer in this. If people understood the radical change that was potentially at every service that a church has, they'd never miss church. They'd never miss. Because here, here's the issue. If I don't understand the radical possibility of change every time I encounter the presence of God, Amen. Then I need to understand more what the Bible has to say about it. Utterance is greatly affected by the hearer. I've been pastoring a long time, full time for a long time, over 20 years. And I can't count the times I've heard people say things about ministers. Well, I don't know. Uh, he just didn't have it tonight. Wasn't him. It was the hearer. The, the speaker can only go as far as the hearer will allow them to go. Amen. And of course, the, the longer you do something, the, the more you're not concerned about the response of, of individuals. But understand the utterance is greatly affected by the hearer. And, and in every service, in, in our services, in, in the churches that we pastor, uh, there's a strong prophetic flow in what we do. And the, and the depth of that is going to be affected by the hearer. Uh, with the meetings we have coming up with uh, Brother Jerry on Sunday. He's operating more and more in the prophet's ministry. Uh, he's still teaching some, and still, but he's operating more and more in the, in the prophet's ministry. And it's important that I come ready to hear. It's important that I, I take some time and say, you know what, I'm going to lay aside some things that would distract me, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be ready to hear what God has to say to me because the way I respond determines the level that I receive on. Amen. And in Matthew chapter 4, and we'll start here in verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 17, it says, Now when Jesus had heard I want to make sure I'm in the right verse. <laughs> verse 17. Verse 12, sorry. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Nephthalim that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the, of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness have seen a great light, and them that sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, notice that Jesus returns from the wilderness and he sets up his home in Capernaum and he preached the gospel. There it is. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
He preached the gospel in Capernaum, healed the sick that were there, and uh, uh, began his ministry. Now, in Luke chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 18, this is also after Jesus had returned from the wilderness, and he comes to the synagogue, and he began to minister. And he said in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You'll surely say to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we've heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, or Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. Now notice something. Jesus is preaching this messianic passage, and, and by what we read earlier, this is his hometown. He's been working miracles there. They see the miracles. They see what he's doing. And Jesus comes and preach, preaches, and notice, they all bear him witness and wondered at those words that proceeded out of his mouth and said, Is this not Joseph's son? And notice what Jesus said. In the next, the next verse, verse 24, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. The Rus Bible says, He said, Assuredly, I'm saying to you, not one prophet is favorably received in his own native country. Now, this wasn't Jesus feeling sorry for himself. Oh, nobody has no respect for me. Nobody will listen to me. Nobody pays attention. No, he was explaining, I've been sent to you, and you're not responding correctly, so you can't receive from me. Amen. It's important. Because here is the greatest teacher the world's ever known. Uh, bar none. The greatest teacher the world's ever known. Not only the Savior, not only the, the Savior of mankind, he's the greatest teacher the world has ever known. He, he is the one that the book of John says had the spirit without measure. It said, but the one to whom God has sent, he has given him the spirit without measure. He stood in all five ministerial gifts. He operated in seven of the nine uh, uh, gifts of the spirit, all of them but tongues and interpretation of tongues. He was God in the flesh, and he's ministering in the synagogue to these people and they can't see and hear what he's saying because they can't get past who he is in the natural. Amen. Notice what they said. They, here is the greatest message they've ever heard. He's telling them what he's anointed to do. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What's the good news to the poor? Don't have to be poor no more. Right? Uh, call, amen. Sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of the sight of the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And they're sitting there going, isn't this Joseph's boy? <laughs> amen. I remember one time, we had just started pastoring uh, in uh, DeSoto, Kansas. And uh, it was the... Uh, uh, very first uh, December 31st service that we had, 
And, and back then we would come and stay till midnight. We don't do that anymore. But uh, thank God. But uh, <laughs> in any event, we were there. And uh, uh, my uh, uh, keyboard player, who uh, uh, happens to be Ron Poole's mom, but in any event, she had to go, she had to come here to Ozark, Arkansas, not too far from here, because a member of her family had died, very close member of the family, so she had to come here. And so uh, I did, all my musicians couldn't be there that night, so I didn't have any music, but uh, a couple showed up that I knew. Matter of fact, they were family, and uh, I knew that she played and he sang, so I went to them and, and asked them if they would help and, and, uh, and whatnot, actually asked them from the platform if they would help. Well, they come and helped, and, and you know, the Lord, the Lord was good to us. But I'll never forget something. They, at that point, uh, they really wanted to, uh, you know, be with us in the ministry and, and, and help out. But I'll never forget something. We were standing in the back of the church, and uh, this individual jumped on me in front of everybody and said, you know, don't you ever put me on the spot like that again. And it, it, it clicked in me right there. They can't work with me because they don't respect me. To them, I'm just whatever relative I am. I'm not the pastor of the church. Amen. Understand something. I'll say this a couple times in this message. I may not know what your problem is here tonight, but there's an anointing in my mantle to set you free from it. I may not know what you're dealing with, but there's something in the anointing God has placed in the office of the pastor to set you free from it. And, and that's why when you come to church, and you come to church consistently, and you come to church regularly like you do, amen, like most do here at our church, amen, and you come regularly, you get answers regularly. You get freedom regularly. You, you, you get abilities, and you, get, you see things, amen, because, because that anointing, you're sitting under that anointing. Now, notice this, that Jesus was explaining I've been sent to you, and you're not responding correctly. So, therefore, you're not receiving. If you look at verse 24, notice what he says. He said this about, uh, or verse 25. He's, he talked about Elijah and the widow of Sarepta, a city of Sidon, a woman that was a widow. And he says there were many widows, but he was only sent to this one. And then verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now notice something. Why, why does he bring that up? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, he's saying overall the Jewish people as a whole are going to be blind to me as the, as the Messiah and the Savior, and the Gentiles are going to come into this covenant. But then he's also showing us something that these were the two that responded. They responded to what the man of God said. When, when Elijah went to that woman, the, the widow in Zarephath, and he told her, he said, fetch me a little water in a, in a vessel. And he said, as she was going, he said, now get me, uh, make me a little cake and bring it to me. And you remember what she said, I don't have enough. And he said, no, go ahead and do as I've said. And as the Lord said, Amen. The barrel of meal will not waste and the cruise of oil will not go dry till the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And it says, and she went and did as the man of God said. Notice she didn't go and do as God said. It's important. She went and did what the man of God said to do. Amen. And it says that when she did that, that she and the prophet and her house did eat many days until the Lord sent rain on the earth. And her son was raised from the dead. Remember Naaman? Now Naaman had some problems, you know, at first. Because he came and the man of God didn't come out and put his hand over him. So, you know, he got mad and kind of scratched off a little bit. He threw rocks up against the house or whatever. That's the Philip Steele version. But, but finally, one of his servants came and said, Now, Master, if he asked you to do some great thing, you'd do it. All he wants you to do is dip in the Jordan River seven times. Well, you remember the story. He went and dipped seven times and came clean. Amen. Amen. So notice what Jesus is saying. He's saying, this is how you have to respond. Even when it doesn't make sense. 
even when it doesn't look like there's any power in it. I mean, how can there be any power in dipping seven times in a dirty river? The power was in the instruction, not in the water. There was no healing power in the Jordan River. The healing power was in the instruction. There was, there was no victory in a cake that the woman made for the man of God. The victory was in the instruction that she followed. It's, it's how I respond. I remember one time Brother Hagin told a story, and uh, he was in a church ministering, and uh, he said that uh, he, there was a guy that lived in the town there, and uh, he would cut in between the church parsonage and another building, and he said when the, the guy would, would, when he would walk, he was all bent over. Well, what had happened was he had been in an oil fire. He worked in the oil fields, and he'd been in an oil fire, and of course the technology wasn't as it is today, and uh, uh, he had been so badly burned that, you know, they had to do skin grafts and different things, and, uh, but a lot, you know, his, his, he just didn't have the elasticity, he didn't have the, uh, 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 the ability, you know, to the, 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 the stretch, you know, the stretch in his tendons and in his ligaments. And he said he was just almost completely bent over. And he said he was at the church that night ministering and the Lord uh, prompted him and said, you tell everybody that needs a healing in their body to come up front. And so he looked and, and here came everybody. And he said there were some people that were in dire shape. He said some people, people had to help them up. He said, here come this little man, barely getting along, just scooting. And he said, and then here come a woman that just walked up there real easy and, and, and just stood up there. Nobody had to help her. Didn't look like anything was wrong with her. And he said, he was standing there and he told him, he said, the Lord is telling me that if you'll take off and run around this building as fast as you can, he'll heal you right now. And he said, man, those people took off. He said, that one old boy, he said, he just scooted. But you talk about scooting for all he was worth. He was just scooting around that building. And he said, and here stood this woman that didn't look like anything was wrong with her. And she took off running, and she just stopped about halfway down the aisle and said, oh, I can't. And he said, I said, what do you mean you can't? She said, I just can't, and sit down. And whatever was wrong with her, she didn't get it, get it healed. That little man scooted up one aisle and scooted around the back and he said he scooted about halfway up the other aisle and about halfway down the power of God hit him he was instantly healed stood up straight was doing all kinds of calisthenics and gymnastics amen other people were healed now 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 think about this that was the response the response was not try to do it it was do it the the more you do it the more you can do it amen I, I, I've told you this story before. I used to tell it in healing school. There was a man that, that was going to the church that had a degenerative spinal condition. And it was a bad situation. I mean, he was, he was losing all mobility from his chest down. And, and it was degenerative. And I had a friend from Nigeria ministering at the church. Great healing ministry. Powerful healing ministry. And uh, uh, they wheeled that man up. And I was up there with him ministering to the people. And uh, he got to this man in the wheelchair. And he said, Brother... He said, the Lord tells me that if you'll try to get up, he'll heal you right now. And I will never forget what this man said. He looked up and said, and laughed and said, well, I can't do that. The Lord said, if you'll try. I got to, folks, I got to believe that if God tells me that, I'm going to try. If I fall on my face, I'm going to try because if, and here's what it comes down to. Do you believe in the person that's saying what God said? If you do, then you act on it and you respond to it, and God does what he said he would do. Amen. This is so important. In Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Because when you rightly see this responding, you receive on a greater level. You receive on a greater level. I, I was reading an article the other day, 
and uh, I'm sort of an information junkie. And uh, I was reading an article the other day, and uh, a minister was talking about uh, different problems in, in churches and whatnot, and he made a statement uh, about the pastor. And now this is a denominational man, so I understand that, but he made this statement about the pastor. Uh, he said, well, you know, because the pastor is an employee of the church, and the Holy Spirit said, that's wrong. And I, I knew it was wrong, but I'm glad he reiterated it. The pastor's not an employee of the church. I'm not your employee. I'm your pastor. Amen. The, the, the pastor's not the reason for the church. He's the gift to the church. You're the reason to the church, for the church, and God's given the church a gift. You, you understand that? People will say, well, you know, God placed me in the church. No, God didn't place you in the church. God, God, God gave you a pastor. Didn't just place you in the church, He gave you a pastor. That, that's important because when you read that scripture in 1 Corinthians, it says, now God has placed some in the church, and then He names the fivefold ministry gifts. He placed those in the church. Now, I've had people over the years say, well, you're making a lot of yourself. Not making a lot of myself, I'm making a lot of my ministry, a lot of my office. Amen. Th this is important because you've got to understand that if you just see, I I've run into people before, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself with that. For instance, with the special meetings we have coming up, if you just see the minister that's coming as just on a natural level, you won't receive what his anointing can give you. Amen. Do, do you understand that? When, when, when people come to a church, I've heard people say things like this. Well, you know, I won't go to a church that the pastor won't hang out with you and you can't go to his house and you can't this. Folks, I've never told anybody that they can't come to my house. If you ask me, can I come to your house, I would never tell you. I'm not going to tell you where I live. You can't know where I live. I'm, I'm hiding from you. I would never do that. But here's the thing. What's more important than hanging out at my house is that when you come to church, you get your needs met. That, that's what's more important. Amen. Do, do you understand this? And so Mark 6, verse 1, it says, And when he came from thence, Jesus, he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this that's given to him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto him, now notice what Jesus equates this to. A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. The Living Bible says, he's no better than we are, they said. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. The Phillips translation says, oh, he's only the carpenter. He's only the carpenter. So notice, they saw Jesus as only the carpenter or Mary's boy. And Jesus said, notice what Jesus said. Jesus said it was an honor issue. In other words, he carried no weight with them. And, and he said that that prophet is without honor in his own country. And notice the result, verse 5. And he could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Mm. Know what it says? Save he laid his hands on a few sick folks. Now, in the Greek, when that word sick, it literally means the sickest of the sick. I mean, it, it means people that were without power to help themselves. But it says he could only do a few of those. Notice, he could do their no mighty work save, except he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. How much more did he want to do? 
How much more did he want to accomplish? Well, we know he wanted to heal them all. So this tells us a couple things. Number one, look what their lack of response did. And number two, it, it totally debunks the myth that Jesus just healed whoever he wanted whenever he wanted. Because it doesn't say he wouldn't do. It says he couldn't do. He could not. And why? Because of their unbelief. Unbelief in what? Him. Amen. Unbelief in Him. And where did it start? They only saw Him as a carpenter. Mary's boy. He's no better than us. He's just a carpenter. The Amplified Bible says that they saw something in Him that they disapproved of and it hindered them from acknowledging His authority. It hindered them from acknowledging His authority or His ability. The ability of Jesus. Now think about that. If the ability of Jesus can be hindered by a lack of proper response, what can happen in the day and age we live in if I don't respond correctly to what's being said? Amen. Because there's the potential for radical, direct change in my life every time I come to church. Every time I come to church, the potential for radical, direct change is there. It doesn't matter if it's a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, prayer meeting. Amen. The, the Spirit of the Lord moved wonderfully, beautifully in Monday evening prayer, intercessory prayer. And it, it doesn't matter how many's there. It doesn't matter who's present. Jesus said, if two or three of you are together in my name, I'm in the midst of you. That wasn't a metaphor. That wasn't an allegory. Jesus meant that. When you show up and you're willing hearted and you're ready to receive, I'm there to give you what you're ready to receive. Amen. So our responsibility is to not limit the working of the anointing that's flowing in the service that we're in. That, that's my responsibility. Because that, 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 that's, so, that's so vital that, that we learn to respond right. Uh, you, you, you'll go to some churches, and uh, I'm certainly not against uh, uh, anybody, but you'll, you'll, you'll go to some churches, and uh, uh, you know something good will happen. The Spirit will begin to move. And immediately, people will jump up and start clapping and just clap, clap, clap. And that's not a proper response to the Word. Now, I'm not against clapping, but I'm saying that's not a proper response to the Word. It's okay to jump up and shout, but the proper response to the Word is to verbally affirm your agreement. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. That, that's a proper response to the Word. And, when, when, and, and, and it's always improper to not respond. That's called bump on the log syndrome. That, that's improper. Why? Because if it's ministering to me, I need to respond to it. Amen. If, if I believe it's true, I should affirm that I believe that's true. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Do, do you see that? I used to be ministering to a guy, and uh, I say to a guy, to the church, and this, this man, unfortunately, he sat right on the front row. And... Uh, and he would, he, would, he would sit like this through church. And if you said something that he thought was right, he'd go, I can agree with that. <laughs> now, I didn't find much that he would say that about. But, <laughs> amen. But, but, but here's the thing. I never saw him receive anything from God. It wasn't just me. It, it was not 
properly responding to the word. Notice what it says about Jesus here in Mark 6. Notice how it hindered. And he, and he could there do no mighty work. Save he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And notice something that it says. It says, and, and he healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. One translation says he was astonished. Another one says he was out of his mind because of their unbelief. Man, you, you've got to be in some pretty stark unbelief to astonish Jesus. Amen. Do you see that? But when a person comes to church and they have prepared their heart, you know, it's probably not best that you sit at home and watch the news right up to five minutes before you come to church. You know, get in the car and turn on country music or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying you listen to it. But, but I want to have my spirit stirred up. I, you know, I want to be praying in the Holy Ghost on the way to church. I want to I wanna come in ready to receive. That's so important. I can remember years ago before we were in the, in the full-time ministry, and uh, we were attending a, a church in Grandview, Missouri, Deeper Life Christian Ministries. And... Uh, uh, it, was, it, it was so funny because uh, it was a, uh, a completely African-American church and we were the only white people in the church. And uh, after I'd been going there for a while, Pastor Morton met with me and he said, uh, Philip, we thought you was with the FBI for six months. And uh, I said, well, no, no, I'm not. And, uh, but uh, as, as a matter of fact, when we go back and we visit there, we're still the only white people there. So, but the point is, is, you know, I was getting fed. My spirit was getting fed so much. It was the only church we had found in the metro area that was preaching faith. And my spirit was getting fed so much. And I was working at that time 50, 60 hours a week at uh, Blue Cross at the job I had. And uh, I, would, I would get off, off of work on Wednesday. We had church Sunday. We had church Wednesday. We had church Friday. And I would get off of, off of work on Wednesday and, and uh, uh, rush home, ride the bus home, get in the car, and then we would come to church. And it was like I would cross the threshold of that church and I could breathe. <sighs> I made it. I made it. Amen. I was, I was prepared to receive. The air smelt better. Everything, the atmosphere was lighter. I just knew I'm here to receive something from God. And I can't tell you how many times... I took my Bible and sat down on that front row, and from the first words out of that pastor's mouth, I was receiving all the way through the service. I would watch other people, and they didn't look like they were getting anything. And I would think, are they not hearing this? Or I, I wanted to just look at my wife sometimes and just scream, Ah! This is changing my life! <laughs> Amen. Are you following me? I, I, and I just wanted to be there. I just and I and I always prepped my heart to receive. I made the decision when I go to church, I am going to receive from the man or the woman of God. I don't care how tired I am. I don't listen. If they say something and it's corrective, I receive it. If they say something and it's and it's edifying, I receive it. I receive whatever's being said, God, because you did not bring me here for any other reason than to receive what they're saying. Amen. So important. And, and, and when I begin to look at it, church cannot just become another thing on the list of things you have to do. It has to be something, it has to be something that holds importance. It has to be something that holds a a level of apartness from everything else. Amen. Why? Because that's, that's how anything that's, that's, if I can say it this way, anything that's special. See, Jesus wasn't special to these people. Now, we think this, and we think, well, my goodness, how could they be so blind? How could they be so, so dull in the spirit? Well, because notice how they responded to him. He's just a carpenter. Just Mary's boy. Amen. He's only the carpenter. 
I don't know, Jesus might have built some of them a table or furniture or something. I don't know. But however, think about this. So Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life in that region just a carpenter. So for 30 years, they've known him as a carpenter, as Joseph and Mary's boy. And now he goes to the wilderness, he's anointed by the Holy Ghost, and he goes to the wilderness and overcomes the enemy, and you know the story. Then he comes to the synagogue and he starts preaching, I'm the Messiah. But all they see is he built me some furniture. Amen. See, it's how you receive. I, I remember, I'm, and, and I talked about receiving in the church we were going to, but I made the decision years ago, uh, I will always receive from my pastor. And I always receive from my pastor by keeping them in a set-apart position in my heart. I was talking with a, a man one time, and uh, matter of fact, he came through that door, and he hadn't been back. Uh, but uh, he was talking to me, and he said, you know, uh, uh, he asked me, he said, so, uh, you know, the Caldwells are your pastor? I said, yes. And he talked about going to the church there, Agape. And he said, yeah, I used to work with, with Happy. That did it for me. That did it. I don't have nothing to do with you. It could be, and, and I told my pastor about the guy, and I said, you know, when he called you by your first name, I said, I question anybody that calls you by your first name. Because that's, how I, that's where I keep them. Now, I know they have friends and, and whatnot, but that's where I, why? I want to receive. Amen. I want to respond correctly to receive. I want to respond correctly to receive. And so the meetings we have coming up, when you come on Sunday mornings, when you come on Sunday night, we have Jerry, of course, being with us on Sunday night. When, when he comes, I mean, a lot of people come and they think they're just going to hear about favor or they're just going to hear about uh, uh, whatever the pigeonhole they try to put him in. But here's, here's the thing. If you come ready to receive whatever's said, it'll work in your life. And you might have to plan to do it. Amen. You might have to plan to do it. You might have to schedule yourself to be able to be there. But see, that's when God shows up and can do something for you because you've moved something out of the way to be there. You've rearranged some things to be there. You're responding to receive. Oh, glory to God. Do you see that? And so I don't, I don't want unbelief or a, uh, if I can say it this way, a familiarity to sit in and stop me from receiving. Amen. Do, do you see this? And so Jesus said, let's, let's, we're going back over some of these verses, but Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. So notice how he's saying this. He's saying, where there's, no, where there's no honor, it's primarily when people don't view you as what you're called to be. Amen. I'm, listen, I'm very blessed. Uh, all, all my family respects the call of God on our lives. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, even my brother-in-law and my sister uh, are in our fellowship, and they pastor a fellowship church in Lee Summit, and we're, we're uh, at Lee Summit, Missouri, we're actually ordaining them on the 8th of March, and, and, and I mean, here's, here's the point, is they tell me all the time, and they tell my wife all the time, I, I, uh, uh, we're so glad God's put you under us, under uh, you as our leader, and when they're talking to me, she don't refer to me as her brother, she calls me her pastor. Why? That's how you're going to receive. If I'm just your brother, that's all I can do for you. Amen. When, when Pastor Ron is ministering, he ministers occasionally here, when he's ministering, you, you, you can't just look at him as Brother Ron. That's, that's the gift that God has placed in this pulpit that night, and he has an answer in his spirit 
for you. When Pastor Larry ministers or, or, or any of the other ministers that minister here, they have an answer in their spirit and in the anointing that's on their life to set you free. And it's for a couple of reasons. They carry their own anointing and they're submitted to the anointing of the house. And when you submit to the anointing of the house, you begin to function in a measure of the same anointing that's on that house. And, and, and people get set free and people get delivered. That's why it doesn't matter who's ministering. If, 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 if there's a situation that I can't be here and I'm not ministering or my wife's not ministering, it doesn't matter if somebody you have never seen or heard before in your life is ministering. If you'll show up and respond to receive, God will bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you see that? Yeah, but you know that guy, uh, he's just, you know, uh, uh, he don't move from behind the pulpit. Well, that's the wrong response. That's the wrong response. Amen. If they don't move around a lot, that just means you've got to do less work. <laughs> Amen. But then there's other people, oh, that guy's just all over the place, and, and he's just... Right, Moving, using his hands and, and, and getting loud, that's the wrong response. Amen. Lord, if, if they shower me with saliva, I'm just, I receive. <laughs> now, we don't like that. It's kind of unsanitary, but <laughs> hallelujah. I hear you, brother. I hear you. Praise God. <laughs> Now, 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 the reason I'm saying that, all of that, is because when, when you get over into things, when people say, you know, I don't like women ministers, they're not, they won't respond correctly, and they won't receive. My dad said most people don't believe in women preachers because women can out-preach them. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but... <laughs> Notice I said my dad said that. I, I didn't say that. But, amen. He could there do no mighty works. How many churches, week in and week out, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just blaming people. There, there are ministers that, that don't flow correctly in the Spirit. But for the sake of our teaching, how many times do people come to church and leave without the answer to their issue or to their problem and many times they go out and they blame the worship, they blame the minister, they blame the distractions, whatever it may be, and it was that they were not properly ready to receive. When you come to church and, and you have your Bible, and whether it's a, 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 a Bible that you turn the pages or you got it on your iPad or your phone, and you got your notebook, and you're ready, man, you're primed and you're ready, Amen. You're going to receive something. You bring a notebook, you're going to receive something to put in it. Amen. 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 But, but if I'm not ready, and, and I know this can sound like a strong statement, but hear my heart. If I come to church and I'm not ready, then what I'm saying by my actions is I'm not going to hear anything that's worthy to write down. Amen. You know, there's a reason that when you went to school, they would give you a list of things that you needed to properly learn. And isn't it interesting that one of those things was a spiral notebook? Number two pencils. I, don't, I guess they still say number two pencils. Because you, you, you want to take notes. And, and didn't you learn in school that while the teacher's lecturing, while they're teaching, they would say, now you want to write this down. Right? And, and, and you'd write it down. If you had a notebook. See, I'm responding to receive. And that doesn't mean if somebody doesn't have a notebook or they're not writing something down, they're bad people. It's just, I'm just saying, that, that when you're prepared and you're ready, you receive from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll make that statement again. I may not know what the problem is that you're facing, but there's an answer in my mantle. There's an answer there. 
Amen. I, I would sit on the front row and I would, I, would, I would tangibly pull on that anointing. I would, I would say all the way to church, I'd tell my wife, I'm going to receive my answer tonight. I'm going to receive what God wants me to do. When, when I go somewhere, when I travel with my pastor, and I travel with him quite frequently, when I travel and, and I'm doing what I'm doing, I tell my wife, I'm going to receive answers that we need this weekend. Even if, even if we don't knowingly need an answer to anything, I'm going to receive. Because why? There's something in that person that I say, that's my pastor. Amen. And I can receive from them. It's, it's a supernatural event. You, can, you can't explain it in the natural. It's a supernatural event that occurs. And you receive those answers. You receive the things that you need because you're responding correctly. Amen. And, 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 and I receive rescues. And I receive wisdom. And I receive the things that I need. Because I, I respond correctly. Hallelujah. Do, do you see that? And when I make that decision... And understand that utterance is greatly affected by the hearer. I remember one time, and I'll try to wrap it up with this. Uh, we were in Birmingham, Alabama. We were, we were actually, actually it, it was a camp meeting, but it was actually Matt Gober's 25th anniversary in ministry. And uh, Pastor Michelle and I had flown, uh, actually flown down. We were uh, living in Kansas at the time. A uh, good friend of ours pastored a church there, still does, Scott Webb and his wife Phyllis. And uh, we were there with them. And uh, the speakers uh, that week were uh, uh, Jerry Savelle, Jesse Duplantis, Brother Copeland, and uh, I think Scott spoke one night. But we got up on a, uh, on a Friday morning, and uh, uh, there were some other supernatural things that happened. But one thing that happened about mid-morning, I just got sick as I could be, just, just sick sick as a dog. I don't know how sick a dog is, but that's sick. And uh, we went ahead and went to church that night. It was Friday night, and Brother Copeland was ministering. And he ministered. I'm, 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 going, I'm going to, so I don't exaggerate, I'm going to say two and a half hours. I know that's not an exaggeration. I think it was closer to three. But I know it was two and a half hours. Man, that first hour, I was the most miserable person in the world. I was miserable, just miserable. I didn't feel good. I kept, you know, I kept wanting to get up and, and, and go to the back. I just, oh, I was miserable, you know, chilling and cramps and, and achy. And, oh, but man, he hit that second hour, and I started feeling better. And by the time he was done, I was healed. Amen. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to preach two hours. But... The, the point is, is making a choice to respond. Making a choice to respond. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you, you ought to come to church when you don't feel good or whatever. I mean, it may not hurt you, but here's, here's the thing that I'm saying. Is how many people would get healed if they would just, instead of saying, no, I'm too sick, I can't. If they would just make an effort to respond, would they receive? And, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I, I understand that, that you hit situations and, and you're receiving at home. And that, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are instances where if I would just take the step and respond to what the Word of God says, I'll receive. Yes. Amen. Amen. I believe God. And so, you know, as we're, as we're moving towards the meetings that we're having this weekend, you know, uh, we'll be having our regular services on Sunday morning. I, I, I want to show up. I want to receive what God has for me. And folks, that starts before you ever come through the door. Amen. Amen. That starts before you ever come through the door. I used to tell people when I was pastoring, I said, look, you know, when, when you get in the car, don't, it's not the time to be disagreeing with your wife. It, right? I mean, don't, don't fuss all the way to church and then wonder why you didn't receive anything. Amen. Or 
be upset with my boss or upset with, with whatever the case may be. you got to take some time because it begins there. And by the time I hit the door, I'm ready to receive. I'm ready to, ha to hear what God has to say to me. And, and, and when praise and worship starts, if I enter in and I lift my hands and I join in the singing, amen, or, or whatever, I'm, I'm responding to receive. I'm responding, I'm opening up a place for God to begin to move in my life. For God to begin to move in my circumstance, to move in my situation. And by the time the man or the woman of God gets in the pulpit, I have primed my spirit to hear from God. Do, do you see that? Hallelujah. And, 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 and the more that I receive, the more I respond, the more I will receive from the things of God. And, and while that may seem elementary, The response has to do with the honor that I'm showing what's being said. I don't know if anybody watched the State of the Union address and, uh, uh, or, or if you saw what the Speaker of the House did. You've probably seen it, right? Tore up the President's speech. And violently, right, in the camera. Well, it's... To my knowledge, it was one of the greatest State of the Union speeches I've ever heard. Now, now here's what I'm trying to point out. In other words, this person saying, I didn't receive anything he was saying. And this is, this is my contempt for what he said. And when they asked the person afterwards, they said, uh, uh, you know, why'd you tear up the speech? Because it needed to be done. Now, now, understand, it's not politics, it's not Republican or Democrat, it's dishonor. An honorable person doesn't act that way. You tried to do something dishonorable and it backfired on you. Now, be honorable and just do the right thing. You went through the legal channels and you didn't get your desire. Now, be honorable about it. Now, here's what I'm saying. So no matter how good things go in the country, that person won't receive it, and they won't be a part of it because of their lack of honor. Amen. And so no matter how much anointing's flowing, no matter how many people are getting set free and getting delivered, there are always people, not you, because you come to church, Right? Not this church, because we, we show up. But here's my point. There will always be people in a body that come, and they don't receive because they didn't respond correctly. They, they saw, oh, he talks about money too much. The music is too loud. Music's not loud enough. Music's too fast. Music's too slow. Music's too high. Music's too low. Music's too old. Music's too young. Church is too small. Church is too big. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the chairs. Right, but what is all of that? Dishonor, misunderstanding. I, I had a lady that could not listen to what I was preaching because she said she kept seeing a demon in my tie. She said that and I looked at my tie. Well, lady, you're a nut. And, and, and so the first time I didn't pay attention to it, the second or third time I wore that suit, both times, she said, oh, there's a demon, can I show you? And here's his crown, and, he, and finally I took the tie off and said, ma'am, here, take the tie, do whatever you want to with it. I think she burned it or something, I don't know. <laughs> there were people getting healed. There were people getting set free. I had a demon in my tie, and people were getting healed. <laughs> now, I didn't have a demon in my tie, you understand? But that, it would make sense that if you had a demon in your tie, people aren't going to be getting healed, Ron. <laughs> Amen? Well, here, here's the point. And, you, and you, know, you know, that person never did receive. But then, I, then I've watched people come in 
and they, man, they, they could care less. They, they could care less what kind of music you had. They could care less who was preaching, man, woman, boy, girl, black, white, big, ugly, handsome. They didn't care. I'm just here to receive. Man, Rus Rusty Shidley, he goes to church. Some of you all met Rusty. Uh, they might be down here this weekend. But, man, God delivered him and set him free from an impossible situation. I went to court with him. He was looking at over 25 years in prison because uh, of some things he'd done in, in sin. And uh, 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 I was sitting there. Boy, that anointing came in the courtroom. And, and the judge... The judge said, I'd never heard a judge say this before. He looked and he said, they'd showed a video of the event. And, and uh, the judge said, look, I don't know everything he said, but I know this, that the man who's sitting before me today is not the man I see in that video. And he said, there has been a change in him. And the judge said this, he's a new creature. The judge said it. Oh, my goodness. You know, and he, he, he said something. He said, I knew my answer was in that church. I could have cared less what they sang or what they did or how people dressed. I was getting set free. And see, the response determined the level of receipt. Oh, glory to God. Isn't God good? So I just want to encourage you. You know, spend some, some when you pray, spend some extra time this week praying about the meetings. Telling God, I want to receive. Write down some things that you want to receive. If you need healing in your body, write them down as your point of contact and bring them to church. If you need victory in your finances, write it down and bring it as a point of contact. Why? You're responding correctly and you'll receive that way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand on our feet. I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. When I was a boy growing up in church, they'd say, I'd rather be here than the best hospital in the city. <laughs> of course, my dad used to say the best jail in the city, so amen. I didn't know there were any good jails. Thank God I've never been in, so <laughs> amen. Thank you, Jesus, other than to preach. So, praise God. God's good to us. Amen. So, of course, uh, uh, Wednesday night, or Wednesday night, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Brother Jerry will be with us Sunday night. Uh, we do have new members class on Saturday. If you would like to attend, uh, you can see uh, Kim Pritchett, and she'll help you with any information that you may have. Amen. So, God is so, so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. Well, come on, say it with me tonight, would you? The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.